Well, if you will turn in your copy of the scriptures to the Gospel of Luke, we are continuing in our study of this gospel entitled, That You May Know the Truth About Jesus. We are going to be in chapter 6, verses 37 through 42 this morning. John Wesley, the founder of the Methodist movement, told of a man that he had little respect for because he considered this man to be miserly and covetous. And one day when this man had attended a worship service that Wesley was leading, they took up a special offering for a charity that Wesley deemed to be pretty worthy. And this man gave just a very, very small amount. And in response to that gift from this man, Wesley openly criticized him. Well, after the service, the man went to Wesley privately and he told him that he had been living on parsnips and water for several weeks. He told Wesley that before his conversion, he had run up many bills and debts And now by skimping on everything and buying nothing for himself, he was paying off his creditors one at a time. Christ has made me an honest man, this man said. And so with all these debts to pay, I can only give a few authorings above my tithe. I must settle up with my worldly neighbors and show them what the grace of God can do in the heart of a man who is once dishonest. Wesley then apologized to the man and asked his forgiveness. You see, each one of us is susceptible to that kind of judgmentalism. Even a man who was as pious as John Wesley. And just like Wesley, there is much that we don't know. We don't know the motivations of a person's heart. We don't know the struggle that they have endured the battle that they have waged with sin in their own life. We don't know all the circumstances that that person faces, and we don't know how we ourselves would have responded in that moment if all of those circumstances were the things that we had endured. And so as a result, we're quite adept at finding splinters in the lives of other people while ignoring the logs that are in our own lives. So in other words, we exercise a hypocritical judgment that extends grace to me, but not to thee. Now, Jesus taught his disciples that this kind of judgmentalism was not to be a characteristic that defined them. In fact, he was most certainly not calling his disciples to be naive. That's not what he was saying. He wasn't saying don't have firm convictions. He wasn't saying that either. And he certainly was not saying don't exercise discernment despite what the world seems to constantly trumpet. But he is teaching us that when we do exercise judgment, it must be a righteous judgment that springs from a heart that has experienced grace and is modeled on Christ. So this morning, will you stand with me as we honor the reading of God's word this morning, as we begin in the 37th verse of Luke's sixth chapter. Jesus says, Judge not, and you will not be judged. Condemn not, and you will not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. Give, and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, will be put into your lap. For with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. He also told them a parable. Can a blind man lead a blind man? Will they not both fall into a pit? A disciple is not above his teacher. But everyone, when he is fully trained, will be like his teacher. Why do you see the speck that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice that the log that is in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, Brother, let me take out that speck that is in your eye, when you yourself do not see the log that is in your own eye? You hypocrite! First, take out the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take out the speck. That is in your brother's eye. Oh Lord, thank you for your word. 
We thank you for the words of Jesus that cut straight to the heart. We thank you that when we read your word, it reads us. And so, Father, we pray this morning that your word would convict us where we need convicting. And, Lord, that your spirit would give us the grace and the strength in Christ to overcome the sin that so often characterizes our judgmental hearts. Lord, we ask this so that we might be better representatives of the transformation that Christ has made in us. All for his glory and, and in his name. Amen. One of the reasons that people have struggled with Jesus' teaching in portions like the Sermon on the Mount from Matthew 5 through 7 or what has called, been called the Sermon on the Plain here in Luke chapter 6 is that the Lord refuses to candy coat the condition of our hearts. He lays it out straight for us and he refuses to lower God's standard of holiness as much as we wish he would. That's why that's what so many want to hear, isn't it? So many in our world want to hear that what they're doing is good enough. That being a disciple doesn't really require us to change all that much. But when Jesus teaches, he pulls no punches. He shows us both the true inclinations of our heart as well as the spirit that should mark those who bear his name. And Jesus, being fully God, understands our hearts better than we do. He knows the truth of who we are. So when he warns his disciples against this kind of judgmentalism, he does so because he knows that we are engaged in a constant battle against that hard attitude. Let me illustrate this for just a moment. How many of you, when you are driving down the highway, notice that everyone who is driving slower than you is an idiot and everyone who's driving faster than you is a maniac? Is that not our heart? We know that all the time. If you've been behind somebody who is putzing along in the left-hand lane, yeah, okay, maybe it's just me. I don't know. But it drives me crazy. And then when I'm driving and somebody just blows my doors off, oh, what a maniac. Even if I may be going a little bit faster than what I ought to be. Right? I, listen, I have, over the last couple of weeks, I have driven from the Gulf of Mexico to Lake Superior, literally. And I've seen all of this, and it has been on my heart. The Lord has been reminding me of this for the last two weeks here. The person who receives the benefit of the doubt is us. That's who we give the benefit of the doubt to, isn't it? Ourselves. We don't give it to those other people. We're quick to ascribe to ourselves the most magnanimous motives, the slightest sin, and the greatest grace. And to all those other folks, let's just say, bless their hearts. Right? That's what we do. But how can we tell the difference between judgmentalism and righteous judgment? Because Jesus says that we are to exercise a righteous judgment. Listen, verses like uh, Luke 6, 37 and Matthew 7, 1, these are the most known Bible verses in America. It's not John 3, 16. It's judge not so that you aren't judged. That's what people know. That's what they quote. They don't know so much about John seven twenty four. Do not judge by appearances, but judge with right judgment. This is a command that Jesus gives to his disciples. So how can we tell the difference between judgmentalism, which is judge not, or, or judge with righteous judgment? Well, judgmentalism can be distinguished by some, some pretty glaring characteristics. First of all, it exhibits a critical spirit. 
Judgmentalism is a critical spirit. And, and what I mean by that is it possesses a harsh, fault-finding perspective. The critical spirit is the one that is always expecting to see flaws in someone and rejoices when it finds them. It doesn't have to look far hard, does it? There's flaws in each one of us. And it's an attitude that looks to condemn others over every minor matter as though they were of primary importance. That's the first characteristic. The second is that it is self-righteous. It magnifies the sins of others while it trivializes our own sin. It's the act of being extremely charitable to ourselves because we're meeting the standards of a moral code that we have established. We built that code, and surprisingly, we meet it. Well, that's not what we do to others. We have that same moral code, and nobody meets it. That's self-righteousness. Jerry Bridges, the author of The Pursuit of Holiness, and, and a book that has one of the most unique titles, Respectable Sins, uh, the subtitle is Confronting the Sins We Tolerate, he once noted, the problem with self-righteousness is that it seems almost impossible to recognize in ourselves. We can see self-righteousness in others, but it's hard to see in ourselves. A third identifying mark of judgmentalism is closely related to self-righteousness, and it is this, hypocrisy. Hypocrisy flows out of self-righteousness, in fact. And to say hypocrite is to use a word that in the Greek meant an actor who was pretending to be someone else. That was what a hypocrite was. Today, we mean the same thing. It's somebody who's pretending to be someone else, someone who wears a mask that hides their true selves. So when we say that, that uh, this kind of judgmentalism is hypocritical is to say that we are all like uh, Captain Renault in the movie Casablanca. Maybe you remember that famous scene where, where this representative of Vichy France walks into Rick's uh, cafe and he blows his whistle and he says, this cafe is shut down, everybody must vacate now. And Humphrey Bogart, who plays Rick, comes up and it says, what are you doing? Why are you doing this? And, and Captain Renault says, I am shocked, shocked to discover that gambling is taking place in this establishment. And at that very moment, the croupier walks up and he says, you're winning, sir. And the captain takes it, puts it in his pocket and says, thank you. That's hypocritical. That's how we are. And this critical, self-righteous and hypocritical judgmentalism is what Jesus is forbidding here. But in contrast, righteous judgment is marked not only by an absence of these hard attitudes, but by a desire to be compassionate and ready to forgive. He says, judge not and you will not be judged. Condemn not and you will not be condemned. Forgive and you will be forgiven. Give and it will be given to you. That is what characterizes righteous judgment. And as a result, we must be careful not to draw too rigid a distinction between the passage we studied last week and our passage this morning as though they're not intricately connected. Remember last week, Jesus told his disciples uh, that, that as you wish others would do to you, do so to them. Be merciful even as your father is merciful. And so Jesus is calling on his disciples to exercise a gracious judgment. A gracious judgment. It is to be reflective of the type of judgment that they would desire for themselves. Listen, do you want people to think the best about you? To believe that you have the best motives for doing what you do? Saying what you say? Then think the same about them. Do to them as you would have them do to you. That is it. That is why Jesus says, for what measure 
you use, it will be measured back to you. That's just another iteration of do unto others as you would have them do unto you. For what measure you use towards them, it will be measured back to you. To you. And the image Jesus uses here, where he says, good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, will be put into your lap. He's describing a merchant who is giving you some kind of product, probably grain. Okay, and you bring your vessel to him to fill up. And rather than just pouring it in until it's kind of full, he takes it and he pours some in. And he presses it down. He wants to make sure every nook and cranny within your vessel is filled with grain. And he shakes it. I don't know about you, but I, we, we have uh, flour and different things like that. And when I'm pouring flour into the container, it'll fill up. And it'll look full, but it's not full, right? If you give it a little shake and, and bounce it around a little bit, it settles down. Some of that air comes out. And, and you're able to get more into that container. And Jesus says, it's not just that. It not, it's not just that it's shaken and pressed down and filled up. Now it's overflowing. The, the merchant just keeps putting into it to the point that when he's done, you have to take your robe and make a basket with it to carry the excess. That it'll be filled into your lap. That's what Jesus is saying. That's the way that we should be approaching this kind of grace towards others. You know, Jesus is not teaching some kind of prosperity gospel here. He's not saying if you just give to others, God's going to give you more earthly treasure. Earthly treasure passes away. What he is describing here is far more important and far greater than anything that moth or rust will consume here. He's saying that when we're gracious and merciful in our judgment of others, we will receive in return a superabundance of the same grace and mercy from God. Can I ask you just a, a simple question? How much grace from God do you need? Do you, all of it. Yes, thank you. <laughs> Great answer. The, the, well, that, that's it. Do, do we want just a little bit of God's grace? Or do we want it overflowing? I, I need it. I need overflowing grace in my life. Because I struggle with sin. I struggle with the flesh. And, and I don't mind confessing that to you. It is, it's a constant battle every day, and I need more. What I need of God's grace is good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over. That's the grace I need and the grace I want. Listen, brothers and sisters, we all struggle with judgmentalism. But when we remember our sins... And that our sins have been so graciously and mercifully forgiven by the Father through the shed blood of Jesus Christ. We can find a power to extend that same grace to others in our lives. Now, having given his disciples this teaching, Jesus employs one of his most utilized methods for illustrating the truth that he's teaching. He also told them a parable. Jesus uses parables often in his teaching, and this time he is teach, using a parable to teach them about the wisdom of rightly judging the example or the standard that they're to have in their life. And once again, we see that Jesus is not forbidding all judgment, as the world might wish, but instead he's calling on his disciples to exercise wise and discerning judgment in choosing an example to follow. We need to have example. In this parable, Jesus is describing that choosing with both a negative and a positive example. He says, can a blind man lead a blind man? Will they not both fall into a pit? A disciple is not above his teacher, but everyone, when he is fully trained, will be like his teacher. 
Now that idiom of the blind leading the blind is one we still use today. It was actually a common idiom in Jesus's time as well. And if it was followed, if, if you had a blind man leading a blind man, it's going to lead to disaster. Invariably, it will happen. And today, there are many who call themselves teachers and leaders. And you can listen to their podcasts and you can watch them on social media or, or streaming services. Or you can read their books or go to their conferences. But if we desire to grow into mature disciples, we must exercise great caution and discernment in who we choose to allow to provide us teaching and whose example we're going to follow. Jesus said in Matthew 24, 24, for false Christs and false prophets will arise and perform great signs and wonders so as to lead astray, if possible, even the elect. Listen, there are a lot of people out there who sound pretty good. I remember I was walking through Meyer parking lot uh, just before we went camping. I was going to get some supplies. And as I was walking through, there was someone sitting in their car with the windows down listening to a preacher. And I heard the voice and I instantly recognized it. It was Joel Osteen. And my heart broke. Because I knew they were listening to a wolf. They weren't listening to a teacher of God's word. Paul, in his departing words to the elders at the church in Ephesus, warned them in Acts 20, 29, and 30. He said, I know that after my departure, fierce wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. And from among your own selves will arise men speaking twisted things to draw away the disciples after them. We must exercise great discernment even when people arise from within the church and claim to be teachers. Because not every one of them is worth following or listening to. And the reason this warning about choosing an example is so important for us is because we become like who we follow. We become like our teachers. There is an old computer science acronym. You maybe have heard of it. It's, it's GIGO, G-I-G-O. And it stands for garbage in, garbage out. If your programming is full of garbage and errors, that's what you're going to get on the other side. Okay, that's, that's inevitable. It is good for us to have mentors and examples and teachers in our life. Because there is much for us to gain from the wisdom that they have accumulated over years and years of faithful obedience to their master. And the goal of any good teacher is to produce students who possess an understanding of the subject matter that makes them like the teacher. When I taught political science, I, I would tell my students, I want you to know how to think. I want you to be people who go out in the world and understand this subject. And it didn't matter if I was teaching an intro to national government or a constitutional law class or a quantitative analysis class. It didn't matter. I wanted them to leave that class not only filled with the knowledge of the class, but the ability to apply it in their lives. Now, when I teach, my goal hasn't really changed. I want the flock that God has entrusted to my care as an elder to not only get information and knowledge from God's word, but the wisdom to know how to apply it in their lives and live it out. I want the people who are here to see the excellencies of Jesus Christ and his exceeding worth. I want them to see how being a disciple changes every aspect of our lives for the better. And I want us to grow in our desire to share that good news with everyone. And so I pray that I'm able to do as Paul does in 1 Corinthians 11, 1, be imitators of me as I am of Christ. Because you see, the standard for every believer is Jesus. It's not a human. 
It's not a good man or a good woman, a great teacher, a great preacher. It is Jesus. He is the good teacher who will always teach his disciples well. And those who follow him are assured of growing into maturity in him. They will grow in their sanctification. And even though we have human mentors and teachers, we follow them only insofar as they follow Christ. Where they deviate from him, we let them go. We do not follow them in that way. Jesus provides us with the greatest example of all. He was gracious, he was forgiving, and he is good. And when we are fully trained, that doesn't mean we're greater than Jesus, as if we have now risen to his level of holiness and can make our own pronunciations on things. It means that we're to be like him. Our lives should reflect his graciousness and how we interact with those around us. When we stand firm on the words of scripture, when we stand firm for what the gospel says, are we reflecting the love and the grace of God or are we using it as a cudgel to beat people down to demonstrate our own superiority? Do do we exercise a readiness to forgive others as we have been forgiven or do we expect a pound of flesh from them first there's many who have approached jesus's teachings as though they're a good moral code for us to follow as if we could achieve these standards that he has laid out for us simply by trying harder and doing better and following some kind of self-improvement regimen but the reality is this You cannot do what Jesus teaches unless you follow him and believe in him. If you have not put your faith in him as your Lord and Savior, you cannot be like him. There is no way to be like him apart from a relationship with him. It's impossible. Anything else is self-righteousness. And self-righteousness denies in every way our need for Christ's sacrifice. Self-righteousness says, I can do it on my own. If we were able to achieve holiness by our own ability, we would have no need for a Savior who sacrificed and substituted himself for us. I want to be very clear when I say this. Self-righteousness is repugnant to God. It is repugnant to the Father because it declares that we have no need of his Son, that we can do it by ourselves, and it nullifies the work of his Son on the cross. In the end, self-righteousness makes us the standard, and that naturally results in judgmentalism and a complacency in our sanctification. It warps what Paul says in Rome, or 1 Corinthians 11, 1, where he says, imitate me as I imitate Christ. It warps that to just say, imitate me. And woe to those who don't. That's self-righteousness. And because of that, because that kind of self-righteousness is always lurking, we need to take time to engage in spiritual self-examination in our lives. We need to look to see if that has taken root in our hearts. Because as we've seen, it is a sin that is notoriously difficult to see in ourselves. So we must take great care in examining our hearts. J.C. Ryle put it this way, the true cure for self-righteousness is self-knowledge. We need to know our hearts. And Jesus uses the illustration of someone who has a log in their eye trying to remove a piece of sawdust from the eye of another in order to show us the need for this kind of self-examination. He he says here in in, uh, the end of our passage, and it's on the other page, I can't flip it, there we go. He says, why do you see the speck that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, brother, let me take out the speck that is in your eye, when you yourself do not see the log that is in your own eye? You hypocrite. First, take the log out of your own eye, 
And then you will see clearly to take out the speck that is in your brother's eye. Did you notice something there? Did Jesus say, don't worry about the speck that's in your brother's eye? No. He doesn't say, don't worry about the sin that's in someone else's life. Listen, that's what the world wants to hear Jesus saying here. They stop at the judge not so that you will not be judged. Condemn not and you will not be condemned. They want to stop right there. That's great, Jesus. Good word. Because I don't want anybody judging me. I don't want anybody telling me that anything that I do is contrary to his word. That's the greatest sin in our culture today, isn't it? To tell someone that they're violating God's standards. It's certainly true in so many aspects of our life. But Jesus doesn't say that. What he says is before you can help your brother or your sister overcome the sin in their life, you have to see the sin in your own life and overcome it and remove it. That's what has to happen before we even attempt to help our brothers and sisters. But that kind of self-examination is a difficult and dangerous duty. And because of this, we often look for tools that make the job easier. And the world's ready to offer us a myriad of tools to help us find ourselves. How many personality tests are there? There's tons of scientific ones, right? Uh, Myers-Briggs is one that a lot of people use quite often. Um, but there's others as well. Yeah, listen, go on the internet and search for a personality test. You'll have more than you care to take. Some of them are actually rooted in the occult, like the Enneagram. It has occultic roots. And people have tried to Christianize it and put a veneer over it. But it is satanic. Make no mistake. Others are just built on psychological psychobabble. That's what it is. You see, regardless of the origin, all of these tests share one thing in common, and it is this. There is a propensity to turn self-examination into self-absorbed navel-gazing. We just look inwardly on ourselves, and we become enamored with ourself. We become obsessed. And the problem with this method of self-examination is that we're searching in the dark, trying to figure out what it is we're grabbing hold of. If you've ever been on a cave tour, if you've ever gone through Mammoth Cave or, or, or one of the many caverns around our country or maybe even around the world, there's always this point on the tour when you're deep, deep in the cave and the tour guide says, okay, everybody get close together, stand still or sit down and turn off your lights. You are about to experience what pitch black darkness really is. And you do, and you turn it off, and your eyes are open, and it doesn't matter. Open, closed, you put your hand right here, you're going to hit yourself in the face because you can't tell how close you are. You can't see anything, and it doesn't matter how long you let your eyes adjust to the darkness. It doesn't matter how hard you strain to see, you can't see anything. That's what we are doing when we try to use earthly tools to figure out ourselves instead of the light of the gospel. We're in the pitch black darkness, grasping around the things, feeling them, trying to figure out what it is. It's, it's kind of like that old proverb about the blind men who are, who are feeling an elephant, but they're only feeling one little part of it. And so they all figure out it's something different. The one that's feeling the tail thinks it's a snake. The one that's feeling the leg thinks it's a tree, right? We don't know because we cannot see. We need the light of scripture as our standard for self-examination. So rather than turning to the darkness of worldly tools to understand the darkness of our hearts, we must shine the light of the gospel into our lives. 
And only then, when we engage in self-examination through the lens of the gospel, can we better understand our own hearts and the sin that can hide there. So what does this gospel-centered self-examination look like? Well, first of all, it recognizes the need for such self-examination because it admits that we wrestle against our sin nature every day, even after we're saved. There remains sin in our flesh with which we must constantly battle from the time we are redeemed until the time Jesus either returns or calls us home. We wrestle with it. In 1 John 1, 8, we read, If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If you say, oh, I'm, I'm sinless now. I've been saved. I don't sin anymore. Well, now you're a liar too. You're heaping sin upon sin. And likewise, when Paul wrote about this, he wrote about it in almost every one of his epistles. But I want to just show you what he wrote to the Corinthian church this morning. When he instructed that church about the observance of the Lord's Supper, he wrote in 1 Corinthians eleven twenty-eight, Let a person examine himself, then, and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. There's a reason why when we observe the Lord's Supper here, we take a moment to examine our hearts for any sin that we need to confess to the Lord before we approach the elements. In his second letter to the church at Corinth, he said in 2 Corinthians 13, 5, examine yourselves to see whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves or do you not realize this about yourselves, that Jesus Christ is in you, unless indeed you fail to meet the test? We need to be sure. Peter would say, make sure your calling. Make sure your election. In 2 Corinthians 10.5, he says, we destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive to obey Christ. Do you see what Paul's saying? He said, it doesn't matter if it's your action or your thoughts. You need to examine yourself and put it all in subjection to Jesus Christ. Put it all under his lordship. We must be ready to examine every aspect of our lives in order to put off the old and put on the new. But second, I want you to see that gospel-centered self-examination resists both self-adoration and self-aspiration. We need to understand this, or self-aspersion, I'm sorry. We need to think of these as the twin ditches that we want to avoid. On the one hand, we might examine our lives and think, you know what, we're doing, I'm doing pretty good. I've got this thing figured out. I don't, I don't make any of the big sins. I don't steal. I don't murder. I think I'm pretty good with God. I, I don't use his name in vain and, and everything. Uh, you know, maybe I covet what my neighbor has sometimes, but that's way down on the list, isn't it? Uh, that's like way down at the bottom, so it can't be that important. That's how we act sometimes when we examine ourselves. But on the other hand, we might be tempted to despair because we see in our lives an area of sin with which we struggle and we just can't seem to get a handle on. We think we've defeated it and it pops up and it rears its evil head over and over. Both of these ditches are dangerous to our growth as disciples because what's driving each one of us or these sides What's driving each one of these ditches is the same thing. It's our heart. It's our heart. And Jeremiah 17, 9 says, The heart is desperate or deceitful among all things and desperately sick. Who can understand it? We need to take time to do that. Our hearts can lead us to a pride that elevates us beyond what we are or a denigration that denies who we truly are in Christ. It can be either one. If it's the first, we end up like the Laodiceans in Revelation 3.17. For you say, I am rich, I have prospered, and I need nothing, not realizing that you are wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. You know, whenever we think we've made it, that's when we're on the precipice of a great fall. Pride goes before the fall. We are called to run this race and continuously strive 
forward, not giving up, not slowing down, but pressing on to make the upward call of Christ Jesus our own. And we do that so long as there is breath in our lungs. We cross the finish line when this life has been completed. You don't retire from the race. You don't slow down in the race. You press forward. And you keep pressing forward until you achieve it. But whenever we're we're tempted to think that because we stumble in this life, that we're somehow less loved by God, or maybe even that we've lost our salvation, at that point we remember on the other side that he holds us in his hand and he has promised to never let us go, ever. That's what the gospel teaches us. The gospel gives us this light to understand that yes, we're sinners, but God loves us. And he loves us so much that he gave his son Jesus to die for us. And it is in that final way that we see the gospel-centered self-examination provides what it provides for those who have put their faith in Jesus. We get to rest in his completed work. There's rest in what Jesus has already accomplished for us. When he said on the cross, it is finished, what he did not say is I've done all that I need to do. Now you pick it up from here and keep going. That's not what he said. He said it is finished. It is complete. The wrath of God was satisfied. And now through Christ we are reconciled to the father. And as a result we can say with the psalmist. In Psalm 139, 23 and 24. Search me O God and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. And see if there be any grievous way in me. And lead me in the way everlasting. Listen. You can't go to God and say, see if there be any grievous way in me, unless you're in Christ. Because if you're not in Christ, then you're under his wrath. Now we can do that without fear of condemnation. We can confidently ask God to take away those grievous ways Because we have forgiveness through Jesus' blood and we have the power to overcome that sin. And we have a sure hope now that what that work is that Jesus completed on the cross, that began our sanctification, it will be completed. Paul said in Philippians 1.6, and I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. Is that not an encouragement? Is that not exciting? For every person who has trusted in Christ, this promise will be fulfilled. He will not leave you. He will not forsake you. He doesn't start a work and then abandon it. If he redeemed you and saved you, he is going to complete that work in you. He will not forsake a single person who has trusted in him because he is faithful. He is trustworthy. And his gracious love for us will never end. Just as we see in Romans 8, 29 and 30, and then 38 through 39, it says, For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. That golden chain of redemption that cannot be broken by anything. Oh, but it goes on, doesn't it? He says, for I am sure that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus, our Lord. What can separate the redeemed from Jesus? Nothing. Yeah, you can say that. You can answer. It's okay. Nothing. Brothers and sisters, when we see ourselves in the light of the gospel, we see that we do not have any righteousness of our own, and there is therefore no basis on which to self-righteously judge and condemn others. And in the light of the gospel, 
we see just how much we have been forgiven, how much we have been shown grace, how much we have been given, and how much we are loved, and how much that changes our judgment, replacing the self-righteous, hypocritical judgment of our old selves with the gracious judgment that calls others to trust in him. And so this morning, I ask you, do you know him? Listen, if you don't know Jesus, then everything you're trying to do, all that self-righteousness, it's filthy rags. It's worthless. It's, it's, it's less than worthless in God's sight. It's, it's actually repugnant to him. He's not neutral towards it. He hates it. Because he has given us Jesus. He has made the way of redemption available to us by the completed work of Jesus Christ in his perfect life, his vicarious death, and his glorious resurrection. And when we say, Lord, I'll get there on my own, we're saying we don't need you. How repugnant, how blasphemous that is to the gift of grace that God has given us in Jesus. And so this morning, as we sing our last song, I urge you, come, cast aside your self-righteousness and cast yourself on the righteousness of Christ. But if you're here this morning and you are a believer and you've been struggling with that judgmentalism, then listen, the cure for it is self-knowledge. The cure for it is knowing what God has done for us in Christ. Seeing our own sin, seeing our own weaknesses, seeing all of that forgiven in Jesus, not because of anything in us that deserved it, not because of anything in us that merited it, but because of God's grace alone. When he is given so freely and fully to us, how can we withhold it from others? Let's repent of that judgmentalism in our hearts. And, and judge with a right and gracious judgment. Let's pray. Father, we readily confess that our hearts can be deceitful. We know that. We know that in our own lives we struggle with, with things that, that we want to let go. We resonate with what Paul says in Romans that the things he does not want to do are the things he does. And the things we want to do, we don't do. It's that battle with the flesh, with that old nature that is waging war within us. Lord, we need more of your grace, good measure, pressed down, shaken, overflowing in our lives in order to overcome the sin that is in our members. Lord, we know that your word has promised victory over sin to all who submit themselves to you. And so, Lord, we come to you in repentance, asking you for the grace and the strength to do just that. Lord, where we have been judgmental of others, where we have judged them harshly and without compassion and without grace, forgive us and give us hearts that love others just as we love ourselves. But Lord, if there's anyone here this morning who has not given themselves to you, who has not come to Jesus in faith, asking for the forgiveness of sins and the eternal life that comes from being born again. We pray that today would be that day. So that we might rejoice with them. Over the salvation that you have given. Lord we thank you for this in Jesus name. Amen.